about the title of the Divine Comedy? When you're, when you're teaching a literary work or approaching a literary work to analyze it, you know, I always used to forget the title. That's the first thing. You've got to talk about the title. So, what about the title? Well, the first thing to say is divine was not part of the title. That was not Dante's title. He called his poem a commedia. Right? He called his poem a comedy. The divine was added in the 16th century by an editor who thought that the poem, because it dealt with religion, should be called... Maybe he didn't like the idea of comedy. You know, sounds like you're going to be having a lot of laughs. It's, it's, there are a few laughs, but not many. So comedy. Why did Dante call his poem a comedy? Well, in the Middle Ages, comedy implied two things. First, it was a work that was written in the mixed style. So the high or formal language register, you know what the linguists mean when they talk about register? It means degree of formality or colloquiality. Degree of formality or conversationality of the language. So... Uh, Four score and seven years ago, our forefathers, that's high register English. The kind of English that you hear in a telephone call is low register English. So, a work written in a mixed style, combining the formal language of epic poetry and tragedy with more colloquial language. So, that's the first uh, aspect of comedy from a medieval point of view. Now, of course, the problem is most people do not consider the style of the comedy particularly conversational. It seems quite high style, right? Quite elegant and quite formal. But you have to remember the Divine Comedy was written in Italian. And Italian was the language of the common people. Right? For serious scholarly or works that hope to be regarded as high art, Latin was the language of choice in Dante's time. So the Divine Comedy is, is a kind of revolutionary work because Dante did not write it in the Latin. And actually he was blamed for not writing it in Latin. Some of the uh, humanists, some of the Renaissance scholars who were uh, becoming absolutely infatuated with classical Latin said to Dante, why did you write this poem in a language where people on the street corner can recite it. Ordinary people, you know, they had this idea that this kind of literature should be reserved for just the elite, educated class. So it's kind of like the way in which classical Chinese gradually was abandoned for more colloquial Chinese language, or Chaucer's choice of English rather than Latin or French for his works. So it's mixed style in the sense that it's not written in Latin. It's written in Italian. A comedy also meant a work which begins in sadness and ends in happiness. Very simple distinction. Tragedy, if you've read the monk's tale, the Chaucer's monk's tale, is the story of someone who is in high prosperity and then falls to great sadness and misfortune. And a comedy is just the opposite. Someone that starts in misfortune and rises to a situation of happiness and prosperity. Well, it's a comedy because it's the story of a life gone wrong which is set right once again. The story opens with Dante lost in the dark wood of error, right, or sin, and it ends with Dante in heaven. So in that sense, very simple ascending plot line, that's what the Middle Ages meant by comedy. The allegory of the comedy, this is where we get into the real interesting part of the study of the comedy. I was trying to reorganize this this morning and make it a little less complicated, but I don't know how to do it. I mean, one of the things that's really, really interesting about the comedy that makes it a work that you can read and reread and reread and the rest of your life you can read it, it's so rich. It's got so many different ways of looking at it. So, uh, you know, bear with me while I try to explain, maybe still not as clearly as I would hope, some of the different uh, ways of looking at the comedy. So first of all is just to say it's an allegory. Most of you probably know that already. 
this story operates on the level of an actual journey and then a spiritual inner quest. So, as an overall generalization about the poem, you can say it's got two levels of meaning. One, an adventure story. The other, something to do with the spirit or religion. So allegory itself comes from a Greek, and I don't know Greek, alos agoroiain, or something like that. Latin, aleni loquim. Both mean other speaking. Dante has his own definition, which is handy for us, in his letter to Congrande. Congrande della Scala was one of Dante's patrons, was a person who supported Dante after his exile, helped him to uh, live while he was writing his poem. And uh, in the uh, preface to the final volume, The Paradiso, Dante writes a letter of dedication to his patron, Con Grande, and he talks about, he gives us his own commentary on his poem and what its purpose is. So he says, the sense of this work is not simple, not single, but on the contrary, it may be called polysemous, many strands. That is to say, of more senses than one. For it is one sense we get through the letter, and another we get through the thing the letter signifies. And the first is called literal, from the letter, and the second is called other speaking, allegorical. Right? So an allegory, then, is a symbolic narrative in which all or most of the characters and events have both literal, concrete, real world, and allegorical, abstract, spiritual, even psychological, talk about that in a moment, meaning. But what distinguishes allegory from symbolism, which is another way which literature uses of saying one thing and meaning something else, is the density and the sequentiality of the symbols. So the symbols come fast and furiously together, and they also form a kind of close sequence, different from symbolism. What are some examples of allegorical works? Well, probably the most famous allegory in the Middle Ages, other than the Divine Comedy, is the Le Roman de la Rose, right? The Romance of the Rose. Chaucer's Clerk's Tale, Story of Griselda, Every Man, Morality Play, Pilgrim's Progress, and Franz Kafka in his castle is a kind of 20th century allegory. Here's a diagram in which I try to show some of the ways in which symbolism differs from allegory. I just took book uh, six of the Aeneid because in the other course I teach Dante along with Virgil, so the students have read the Aeneid, or at least they've read the sixth book. And so there's one situation that occurs, which is the death of one of Aeneas's companions, Mesenius who dies just before Aeneas makes his journey into the underworld. Uh, the Aeneid also contains the story of the journey to the world of the dead. And so this guy dies. And it's pretty clear that the death of Mesenius is a symbol that prefigures the journey that Aeneas is making. Because, you know, the usual way you get to the underworld is to die, right? You know the old joke? A British person in New York goes up to a guy in New York and says, can you tell me the way to the underground? And the New Yorker says, drop dead. You know, <laughs> so the underground, right? So that's a symbol. There's a lot of narrative about, you know, getting ready uh, to go down there, bearing the Zanus and so on. There's no, symbol there's no symbolism. That's just literal narrative. And then Aeneas finds the golden bow, which is kind of talisman. It's like a magic object that allows him to violate the normal rules and visit the, the world of the dead while he's still alive. That's a symbol, right, the golden bow. So a work of allegory has symbols, but it's almost a narration of symbols. Look at the first canto of Dante's poem. There's a traveler, and the traveler represents every person, right? There's a dark wood, sinner air. There's the sun, God, enlightenment, knowledge. There's a mountain a way to get up there. There are three beasts that block Dante. So almost every detail of that first canto has a secondary meaning, right? 
Now, as I'll point out later, this is a little bit of an exception. Usually, the allegory is not quite that dense. That's personification allegory, we call it, where every detail is personified as a symbol. But it's certainly much more dense than the allegory of, for example, the Aeneid. So allegory is not a common form of literature today, but medieval people were accustomed to seeing events in the physical world as signs of spiritual things. We talked about that just now, the Book of Nature. So they expected stories to have an allegorical meaning. What would have seemed strange to them is a fictional narrative that didn't have some kind of spiritual significance. They, they looked for their works of literature to be something more than just stories. Now, this is where it gets complicated, levels of meaning in the comedy. We can talk about the literal meaning, then three levels of allegorical meaning, and then something I've decided to add, which is really important, but I haven't really emphasized it in previous classes, a kind of aesthetic story. This is metafictional, right? You know the idea of metafiction, a work of literature that reflects on the fact that it's a work of literature, so one of the things that Dante writes about is how difficult it is to write the poem that you're reading. So the literal level is simply an adventure story. I told the story of the comedy to my children. De-emphasize certain parts of the Inferno. But, uh, you know, it's an adventure story. It's a uh, journey to the center of the earth, right? And you get three different kinds of traveling. Hell is spelunking, that's cave exploration, you know, who would like to do that? There are people, they get little lights, ropes, and they go down into caves, and they, you know, it's like mountain climbing, except it's the other way. And then purgatory is alpinism, mountain climbing, and then heaven is space travel. And of course, what's interesting is Dante meets all these people, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of characters with speaking parts, and more than that, of people that he just sees. Some of them are legendary, like he sees Aeneas, he sees uh, Satan, but some of them are historical, real people. A lot of them are from medieval Italy, and even more of them from Florence. So it's a combination of fantasy and actual historical figures. So on the literal level of the narrative, then, these encounters are thought to or imagined to have occurred outside of the traveler. That is, he's traveling and these people are out there, right? All these events are outside. Well, the levels of allegory, three levels of allegory. First, a journey of individual spiritual salvation. So it's a moral or spiritual journey, as well as an external adventure. The individual soul goes through three states of human life after death. And the state is decided by weighing one's good or bad deeds, and, don't forget this, the presence or absence of being repentant. So hell is a spiritual state, as well as a physical place. It's not being happy forever, being excluded from being in the presence of God. Purgatory is hope of happiness, being on the way to happiness, climbing the mountain. And heaven is perfect happiness, being united with God. So you can see the journey, external adventure story. You can also see it as something that happens in the mind, a spiritual journey which reflects three states of a person's Happiness or unhappiness, right? Hell, completely unhappy. Purgatory, hope of heaven. Heaven, perfect happiness. How do you achieve those states? So on the allegorical level, these places re represent emotional or mental states within the traveler. Now, still, I'm just working through a children's version, better than nothing, of Chiyoji, right? And I've had a lot of journal entries, you know, that say, well, Dante makes a journey, and, you know, Sansang makes a journey, and 
Dante has Virgil and Samson has, you know, pig and fire sand, <laughs> monkey, and, you know, but that, if you're going to write a, an entry, and I wish somebody would, what I would really like to know, would you know, take you a little bit of work and research, how does the allegory of the interpretation of Journey to the West work? You know, because I know from reading, you know, my Chinese literary history books and so forth that Journey to the West is an adventure story, like the Divine Comedy. It's also an allegory of a Buddhist progress towards enlightenment. And that thing that Monkey wears is, you know, something like discipline that he has to, you know, submit himself to to be able to achieve a kind of enlightenment and so forth. But I would really like someone to write a detailed comparison between the allegory of the Divine Comedy and the allegory of Journey to the West. So that's a kind of uh, something you can consider if you, if you feel that you've got the background and the interest. So the fact is that the literal and spiritual journeys are connected because the closer a person is to God in the physical universe, the more of God's spiritual light that he or she receives. So there's a kind of a, it's hard to know what to call it, a gravity of love. The descent into hell is very difficult for Dante because he's moving away from the place that he really should be going towards. He's running counter to his human nature to move away from God. And so the lower he goes, the less light there is, the less warmth there is. That's an important thing. Uh, when I was teaching Canada, I lived in a very cold part of Canada for years and years, and I would say, you know, the bottom of hell is very cold, and the students, that's right, much worse than heat, much worse to be cold than to be hot, so we normally think of hell as, you know, flames and everything, but Dante, no, the bottom of hell is extremely cold, freezing cold, there's a wind, as well as just being cold, so it's less light, less warmth, less space, because hell is conceived of as a funnel, that as you go down, the narrower it gets, less freedom. And finally, at the very bottom of hell is Satan, source of all evil in Christian uh, thought. And he's frozen, immobile, unable to move, right in the center of the earth. Purgatory is a climb towards God. And the interesting thing about the climb is that the higher Dante goes, the easier it is. You know, I used to climb mountains. Generally, a mountain, the higher you go, the harder it is. You know, you're, you're exhausted, plus it usually, you know, it usually gets steeper. But the mountain of purgatory, because as Dante climbs the mountain, he's losing his sins. He's throwing off what's weighting him down towards making him head this direction. He's lighter and lighter until by the time he reaches the top of the mountain, he's just sort of jumping along, you know, with huge steps, no problem going up. And then when Dante gets to heaven, you kind of wonder, you know, is he going to have wings? How is he going to do this? No, it's very subtle. He just looks at Beatrice, and the next second he has gone up a level. It's sort of like spiritual drive, you know, what... Uh, in Star Trek, you know, uh, Captain Kirk says, you know, Scotty, give me warp drive. And it goes, Whoosh, and they're there, you know. That's sort of the same, you know, that when all those things come at you, and then the next thing you know, they're in a different part of the universe. That's exactly the way Dante ascends through heaven. It's effortless, right? All he has to do is to think about going higher, and he goes higher. So there's the geography. These are many diagrams, but this one I like a lot. Gives you the whole sort of geography, right? The, the part of, that's the earth. Here's where Dante enters hell. He goes down through all of these levels. Here's where Satan is. This is like a very narrow channel that's caused by a river. And like everything in the Divine Comedy, there's an explanation. That river comes from the Garden of Eden. It's the River Lethe. It washes away all your memories of your past life. And, you know, your memories of your past life usually include things that you did that you shouldn't have done, and so that memories are taken back down to the source of all evil. So in any case, this is hell, the fall of hell. There's Satan. There's the way out. Here's the mountain of purgatory. 
where he climbs up terrace by terrace. And when he reaches the top of the mountain of purgatory, he gets back to the Garden of Eden, which, according to the Bible, is the place where the first man and the first woman lived before they disobeyed God. So it's like you know, getting back to um, getting home, where you started out from all those thousands of years ago. And then the trip through the heavens is, uh, these are the various uh, spheres of the, uh, the first one is the moon and then Mercury, Venus, the sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, the fixed stars, the prima mobile, and then finally out into the uh, Empyrean, which is the place that Dante has his vision of God. And he first sees heaven as a white rose, and then he sees it as a point of intense light surrounded by nine circles. There's another way you can look at the allegory of the Divine Comedy too, and see it as a kind of psychological journey. Now, not everybody is a theist, and so maybe this would be a way of looking at it that would be more interesting to you. All of you know as graduate students in Beda about Sigmund Freud, an Austrian physician who specialized in the treatment of mental illness. And as he was dealing with his patients uh, over the years, he gradually developed a theory of the personality. And as you know, uh, Freud's idea of the personality is that the personality is like uh, an iceberg, right? Uh, that, uh, you know, this is the part of the iceberg that you see, but there's all of this below the surface of the water. And so this is the conscious mind, the everyday waking mind, and this is the subconscious or unconscious mind. And he developed a method for treating his patients that's called psychotherapy. And what psychotherapy attempts to do is to bring memories and emotions and conflicts of the unconscious mind to conscious awareness. And uh, this is done through asking the patient about his or her earliest memories, childhood conflicts, the analysis of dreams. Dreams is a way to get access to this subconscious part of the personality. And so really what psychotherapy is, is a kind of a descent into the unconscious. And uh, one of the ways you can look at the divine comedy is as a kind of psychotherapy. So the journey into hell is really a journey into the depths of the narrator's own personality. And the journey can be seen as a, a progression from deep depression and despair. That's what Dante confronts when he's in the dark wood and during his period of time in the inferno. Then, as he's climbing the mountain, you can see that as the successive stages of healing that he goes through. And when he reaches heaven, that's mental health, right? He has reached a state of mental and emotional equilibrium. So he's back to a happy adjustment to life. A final way you can look at the allegory of the comedy is to see it as a communal journey. Now, when I teach this course to the undergraduates, I've just finished teaching the uh, selections from Virgil's Aeneid. And when we're talking about the Aeneid, I'm constantly stressing how Virgil placed an emphasis on the community and the importance of the community. Uh, when I first taught in China, back before some of you were born, I was teaching just a general class in the modern classics, and I taught Conrad, and I taught Joyce, and I taught uh, Yeats and Wolf and so forth. And uh, towards the middle of the semester, one of the students, these are graduate students, excellent students, really great students, came up and he said, you know, why are all of the works that you're teaching us deal with personal problems? When are we going to read a work that deals with social, you know, conflicts and issues? And it was a really uh, eye-opening thing for me because I didn't even realize that was true. You know, I had been teaching these works so long and I was so used to, you know, teach the dead, teach the secret share, you know, these works that it never occurred to me. Yeah, they're all about problems of the individual, nothing about society. Well, you know, back in 1984, China was still 
you know, a very rigorously uh, you know, communist socialist society. And so obviously the students were concerned, you know, where are we going to get some good social issues in this class? So uh, in any case, the fact that Dante is a Christian and necessarily concerned with personal salvation, I mean, that's an important, that's an important priority for a Christian, you know, the salvation of his individual soul. It does not mean that he abandoned the classical emphasis on the welfare of the wider community that you find, for example, stressed in Virgil's Aeneid. So Dante, like Virgil, believed that the individual can only achieve his or her fullest development as a member of a community. And for Dante, a person's personal spiritual salvation is largely dependent upon the kind of community that he lives in. So you need the support of a virtuous and a well-ordered community in order to make this journey of personal salvation. So the two are connected. And this seems to me to be a major emphasis of the comedy as well. Dante, of course, we'll see a little more about his biography in a moment. Dante had bitter personal experiences in political life. He was a politician. He wasn't just a writer. He was an active politician in the early part of his career. And uh, it led him to the conviction that his own society lacked the kind of governance that would make possible individual salvation, that would lead the members of that society on a path that would take them to God. And that's why throughout the comedy, Dante's talking about personal matters, but he's also talking about society. He's also repeatedly complaining about the chaos, the corruption, the greed, the treachery of the leaders of his day, both secular and church leaders. Interestingly, when you read the Paradiso, and you come to this, what you expect to be a very personal scene where Dante says his last goodbye, as it were, to Beatrice, who is the blessed lady who has led him to God, and then she says something to him, you know, you're expecting her to say, you know, goodbye, dear Dante, or something. No, what she says is a, uh, makes a speech condemning the corruption of the church and a lament for the death of the emperor, Henry VII. So for me, this is uh, like... Uh, confirmation of the fact that, you know, it's not just a story about one person's problems in achieving uh, salvation, but this is about the society as a whole. Now, the solution, in Dante's opinion, to the problems of Europe, and especially of Italy, is outlined in a Latin treatise that he wrote called De Monarchia, concerning monarchy. But it's also repeatedly expressed in the comedy. And the solution for Dante is the separation of church and state. Now you're thinking to yourself, gee, the separation of church and state, you know, isn't that pretty much a medieval kind of thing? You know, the papacy and the empire fighting for power and so forth. You know, would that it were. There's a lot of evidence that the U.S. is tending towards theocracy, Right. Just the other day, a sanatorum, sanatorum, whatever his name is, said that uh, Barack Obama doesn't have a theology that's based in the Bible, more or less saying, you know, he's not a good Christian. Well, I mean, that's deadly in U.S. politics. You know, you've got to be a good Christian. And uh, obviously, in other parts of the world, there are theocracies. Iran is a theocracy, right, where the church rules the secular society. So Dante's idea is the solution. You can't have one of these powers completely dominating the society. And uh, for Dante in the De Monarchia, the emperor should have absolute control over civil life and should maintain social stability, the prosperity, the economic prosperity, so that citizens could live satisfying and moral lives. And the pope its power should be confined to the spiritual matters of existence. So the problems of Italy were mainly due to the lack of a strong secular power and the resulting accumulation of both spiritual and secular power in the papacy. This is why Dante felt 
Rome was becoming so corrupt that it was becoming overly concerned with material power and material wealth. Lord Acton, a British politician, you've heard this saying before, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And today, of course, we've got a unipolar world and all the problems that brings. And Dante's idea, still very much uh, you know, relevant today, is that there has to be a balance in his time between the papacy and the empire, in our time between the world's last superpower and some other countervailing power that won't allow one uh, country or one group to totally dominate the world. So a final level of the allegory in the comedy is the way in which the poem presents a journey towards the ideal of a truly loving and just society. So again, you can look at the three parts of the poem in terms of the way in which they depict a society. The society of hell, the society depicted in the inferno, is it's a dystopia. You know that term? You know what a utopia is? That's an ideal society. A dystopia is the opposite. It's a society in which everything is anti, is against what a true society should be. And so you find, you know, cruelty and violence and insult, deception, greed, treachery, all of the antisocial types of behavior that are possible are found in Dante's Inferno. Now, when we get to Purgatorio, which is one of the reasons it's a much more pleasant place to read about, uh, people are helpful. They respect one another, right? They're all working towards a common goal. And, of course, when we get to uh, Paradiso, we get, you know, what the Chinese government today is striving for, a harmonious society, right? I mean, there is the perfect harmonious society. No conflicts, no hatred, no envy, no greed. So on this level of meaning, the story of the journey is one of gradual progress towards the attainment of what people in the Middle Ages called the heavenly Jerusalem. That's what the parson calls this uh, state of perfect happiness at the end of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. He says, I'm going to show you, we're talking about pilgrimage in the last class, I'm going to show you how this geographical journey from London to Canterbury can be seen as a symbol of the spiritual journey of every person to Jerusalem Celestial, he calls it. Heavenly, the heavenly Jerusalem. Or the city of God. That's what St. Augustine called it in his famous book, The City of God. An ideal community, which should be the model for human society. Right? The earthly city and the heavenly city the idea is to, to make them as closely resemble one another as possible. Finally, this is not an allegorical level of the poem, but, but another level of meaning, which I've just sort of been thinking about lately. And you can see the journey again, uh, so literal, allegorical, and you can see it as an aesthetic journey. Like it's not a really good way to term it, but, but a literary journey. A journey that involves the problem of actually writing the work itself. So there's a strand in the story which deals with the writer and his problems in writing the work. Now most of you have you done your narratology and so forth. You know this is called metafiction or self-referential. A self-referential story. A story which you know, reflects back on the fact that it's a story, right? self-referential. And so we find Dante faced with this problem. You know, it's, a, it's a, one of the reasons it's a great work, is that he takes on such an incredibly difficult writing task. He wants to present in vivid detail three worlds that no one has ever seen. It's totally imaginary. And uh, so he frequently complains that he doesn't have the ability to do this. It's a very difficult task. He frequently complains the readers are too weak to follow him. When he starts Paradiso, we'll read the passage. He says, you know, 
I'm now setting out on my boat through a sea that no one has ever sailed before. And he says, if you're in small boats trying to follow me, you better go back to port because you're not going to be able to do this. But if you've got a fairly good boat, just stay in my wake. You know, it's a beautiful metaphor. It's like he's, he's, he's here, he's making the voyage with this poem, and then you're back here, you know, kind of going along in his, in his wake, you know, like, like in the shadow, or where, the, where the water is not so rough, you're following along behind him as he makes this journey through the description of heaven. So the problems, of course, are particularly difficult in Paradiso because he's talking about something that's infinite and trying to use human language to describe something that the finite powers of human language cannot describe. Maybe the most important point about all of this general introduction to the comedy is to say that the reader is meant to make the journeys with Dante. It's obviously a necessity for the reader to identify with the pilgrim narrator, right? With the, with the persona, the fictional version of himself that Dante creates to make the journey. So we're supposed to obviously enjoy the adventures. You know, it's scary and it's uh, and sometimes a little bit funny and sometimes it's very sad and we're supposed to experience all those emotions just like Dante does. But we're also supposed to make the spiritual, the psychological, and the communal journeys. And in the Inferno, the first part of the poem that we'll begin looking at hope today, what that means is we have to examine all the ways we can separate ourselves from God, if you don't like that you know, way of looking at it, all the ways we can make ourselves really unhappy, because that basically is what Dante is talking about in the Inferno, and then, having examined all the ways we can make ourselves unhappy, rejecting those types of behavior, turning our back. I mean, literally, it's such a beautiful thing. At the end of the Inferno, Dante reaches the center of the earth, and he crawls along the body of Satan, who is stuck right in the middle of the earth, as far as possible. God is beyond, so this is as far as you can get away from God. That's where Satan ends up when he rebels against God. And he's crawling down the side of Satan. And all of a sudden, up seems down, and down seems up. And he's so confused. And uh, 12 hours had passed. And he says to Virgil, what's happened? Where is he? Why do I see his legs? Where's his head? And so forth. And Virgil says, well, you've crossed the center of gravity of the earth. And now, we're going to climb out. And so it's, it's both a spiritual turning of... Dante Pilgrim's back on Satan and on everything that he experienced in the cone of hell. And it's also a spiritual turning his back. Because once he turns his back and starts climbing up, he never, he never goes back. He's beyond all that, right? He has rejected all of that. Everything that he saw in hell. So the poem's relevance is not limited to the life to come, if there is such a life. Dante meant the comedy to have relevance for us here and now. He writes in the letter to Con Grande, we talked about that last time, that the purpose of the work is to remove those living in this life from a state of misery and guide them to a state of happiness. So the teaching of the work is not simply with regards to the life to come. It concerns how you can make yourself more happy here. The necessity of engagement, that's what the French say, engagement, being engaged. As graduate students, I know you're very busy, papers to write, worrying about your thesis, and so forth, and you begin to think, oh, you know, it's miserable work, but somebody has to do it, you know, I guess mm, it's, it's more than that. It better be more than that. If you're doing an MBA in accounting, then it might be boring work, but somebody has to do it. But if you're doing literature, it should be something more personal, something more emotional, something more joyful, something more broadening. The study of literature should have a personal relevance. That's why literature is called a humanities subject. Now, I'm not 
advocating a completely impressionistic kind of literary criticism where you just say, oh my God, how beautiful that is, isn't it? You know, no. I mean, I also, you know, scientifically collect evidence and analyze style and language and so forth. That's part of it. But it's got to be more than that. It's got to be more than a dry kind of scientific research. And one of the best things about the comedy, in my opinion, is that it presents the reader with an elaborately worked out system of beliefs. Dante embodies in his story values and attitudes that he meant to be directly relevant to the reader's own experience and behavior. That's why he wrote the work. He wasn't writing a work about literature. I just read a book by a friend of mine, actually. The whole thesis of the book is that the Divine Comedy is about poetry and the problems. You know, that's I've just added this, see. I've done my work. I've paid my uh, respects to that, that interpretation. But that's not the main intention of the comedy. It's not a work about literature. It's a work about the individual and his situation in the world, which should have direct relevance to every reader, not just literary critics or literary authors. So he embodies in his story values and attitudes he meant to be directly relevant. Of course, I'm not asking you to become medieval Catholics. One of the students was asking me during the break, last class, you know, so what are your views? And I said, well, you know, I'm confused like everybody else. You know. I'm not asking you to become a Christian of any variety. In fact, it's embarrassing for me today to call myself Christian, because there are so many people who seem to me to be anything but Christians who claim to be Christians, right? But a reading of the Divine Comedy should encourage you to think about the big issues of life, the kind of things we almost never talk about, right? I mean, how many times have you sat down to, you know, a meal with your boyfriend and said, you know, what is the true nature of evil? <laughs> you know, I mean, you don't talk about those things, but they are important. They are very important, right? What's the nature of evil and of good? How can you define those, describe them? Not just on the level of personal, but also on the level of society. What is really needed for true and lasting happiness? You know, when you get a BMW, is that going to make you truly and lastingly happy? It won't. It won't, you know? So what, what is necessary to be really happy in an enduring way? And what's the purpose of life? You know, this is the cartoon question. What is the meaning of life? Well, the thing about Dante is he's got definite answers to these questions. He's like an obnoxious friend who has the answers to everything. Now, when I was teaching Canada in this nice liberal arts college, we had a philosopher. And he was a Catholic philosopher. He was a Catholic college. And he was brilliant. You know, he was a really important philosopher. I don't know how he... Well, he didn't stay there long. He stayed about five years, and then he went on to better things. But the thing that was irritating about him is we would be sitting having coffee and discussing almost anything, and he would have an opinion on it. And one day we were talking about someone had just gotten a puppy. You know, oh, the little puppy, how cute, how nice it is to have a little doggy around the house. And he said, he said I cannot agree with people keeping pets. And it you know, it was like... <laughs> You know, we were just having a little social conversation, all of a sudden, whoosh, philosophical discussion. <laughs> and so you go, well, why not, Jermaine? And he said, well, you know, number one, you know, serve no useful purpose. Number two, you know, do you realize how much it costs to keep a dog over a year when you take all the dog food and the vaccinations and, you know, the leash and I don't know what else? And he had the whole thing worked out. You know, it's this much money. He said, you know, you could give that money to a charity that could go to help somebody in the third world, you could, you know, probably save a child's life with the money that costs you to keep that dog for a year and so forth. And everybody just kind of staggered, you know. And you're trying to find answers, because I had a dog, a cat, you know, and I'm thinking, well, how do I justify this? So Dante is like that, you know. He has got the answers for him, for him. And the point is, you don't accept his answers, but it makes you think about your own answers. Just like we had to think about, how am I going to justify, after what I've heard Germain just say about keeping pets, how am I going to justify keeping this dog? 